When we talk about energy, there are a few requirements we ask our energy to comply to. They come as follow. We want our energy to be available, and by available, I mean the technology itself to use that energy source. So first, this is the first requirement we need. Second, we need it to be cheap, because expensive energy simply doesn't make sense. Third, it needs to be controllable and safe. Fourth, it needs to be abundant, and finally, especially in this century, we need our energy to be clean. So what are the sources of energy that we use nowadays on the planet? Well, of course, we have fossil fuels, namely oil, coal, and gas. On the other side of the spectrum, we have what we call the renewables, namely wind, solar, and hydroelectric power. And finally, we have the nuclear energy. So how do these energies comply to these requirements that we want? If you look at fossil fuels, they are essentially available, cheap, controllable, and safe. Well, abundant, I'm not sure. Some people are talking about the peak oil, but in any case, whatever we want to say about it, fossil fuels are a finite resource, and eventually they will die out in 100 years or so. So it's not something sustainable to look for. And especially, they are not clean. Especially if you are thinking of CO2 emissions and global warming. So of course, when you see this, the answer comes in automatically, okay? We go for renewables, right? Yeah, obviously. So we have, they are available, they are controllable and safe, they are abundant and they are clean. We have a winner here, right? No? Huh? Well, not so fast. The problem with renewables right now is they are not cheap. Let me give you a quick example. If you want to produce our four gigawatts of electricity in Lebanon out of solar energy, because our country is more of a solar country than a wind country, so we need something like 84 square kilometers with, with the best technology available of solar power uh, generators. And that's not that, because you'll have like the day and the night, so you have like, you need to also store some energy. So the price tag will be really high. And this is a quick comparison between the prices of uh, fossil fuels and solar energy. You see where it ranks. So where do we go now? All the industrial, industrial countries thought, thought, okay, if you want to fight CO2 emissions, that's very good. We cannot right now rely on uh, renewables because they are very expensive. They are, do not compete with the actual uh, technology of fossil fuels. So what, what, what we, where we go? We go nuclear, of course, we have it. Okay, nuclear is available, nuclear is abundant, nuclear is cheap. The problem with nuclear is it's not safe. Okay, mind you, mind you, still in the world, it, it has the lowest casualty rate per kilowatt hour produced. But the phobia is there, and there's a good reason for it. And especially, nuclear is not clean. It's a very dirty process, especially after Fukushima. So what are you saying here? Okay, okay fine. Salim, uh, oil is uh, out of the question. Renewables are not yet, re yet ready. Nuclear, put it to the trash. What do we do? We are doomed, right? No, not so fast. We do have a solution. And the funny part is that solution was developed in the 60s and was put in the drawer for weird reasons. That technology is nuclear, is a new type of nuclear energy. And I'm going to go a little bit technical with you. Please bear with me, OK? Uh, somebody in the, in, the, in the end of the room says, oh my god, here he goes, OK? I'm just trying to be as simple as possible. And I apologize from the engineers in the room for being oversimplistic. So, here we go. When we want any kind of uh, production of energy, we need a heat source. That heat source needs to be out of fuel, coal, or anything else. That heat source will boil some water. 
okay? And that water will transform to vapor. That vapor will uh, go to the dynamo, the generator, that will produce electrical power to the grid. Basic, simple, huh? we all know that, okay? Nuclear is no different than that. So the actual nuclear technology that we have right now all over the world goes a little bit like this. It starts with this process that we call big mining of uranium, and we have this enrichment plant to produce the uranium enriched pellets. By the way, when you have an enrichment plant, you can produce nuclear bombs. And that's another issue with nuclear energy worldwide. Okay, it's called proliferation. And finally, you put those pellets into the reactor. So how does this reactor work actually? What we have now is the light water reactor. That's the most commonly used technology worldwide. Essentially, it is a big, thick steel tank. And this big, thick steel tank, we fill it in with water up to the rim. And we put inside it the solid fuel. Okay, let me just give you an example. What is the enriched uranium fuel cell? It is like holding a rod of metal that suddenly starts glowing red hot in your hands. There's nothing magical about it. This is nuclear energy, okay? So we put in the tank, and suddenly this thing starts boiling water up to 300 degrees Celsius. So at this temperature, water becomes vapor, totally true, okay? So we want to keep water liquid. For this reason, we put it under high pressure, something around 153 atmosphere. So here's the trivial question. When you have when you have very hot temperature with very high pressure in a tank and you fail to cool it down, what will happen? Boom, exactly that. So this is exactly what happened at Fukushima, a little bit, well, give or take. So that's why we add to this reactor core, we add some redundant cooling systems and we build over it some huge construction, a concrete, a concrete confinement chamber. All this just to keep it from going off. Okay, these are the reactors that we have right now in the world. So this is the guy. This is Alvin Weinberg. This is the guy who invented the light water reactor. Okay, we should hang him. No, not really. In the 60s, <laughs> in the 60s this guy came up with an idea, a crazy idea. He said, what if we can do something with nuclear that makes it safe, clean, abundant, cheap, okay? You must be saying, I, I have been smoking something, right? Well, he did it. He actually did it. He built what, what he called the molten salt experiment. The molten salt reactor, the idea in the molten salt reactor was basically to, to replace the, the whole mix of uh, solid fuel and water with something we call salts. They are solid at normal temperature, and at the high temperature, they become liquid. So essentially, it all boils down to this. I'm replacing all this trash inside the reactor with uranium fluoride. Okay, uranium fluoride is a little bit like sodium fluoride that you use in your toothpaste, except you cannot brush your teeth with that. Okay, so here it is. We have something that is liquid at high temperature. It doesn't need any pressure. So here goes the pressure chamber. Cute. And since it doesn't need any cooling system, here goes the cooling system. And finally, of course, we don't need a confinement chamber. So you see the reactor is so cute, so small, so cute, that the guys at Oak Ridge used to shut it down for the weekend and turn it on again on Monday. It's amazing. So Alvin Weinberg came with another idea, a very brilliant idea. He said, what if we can use, instead of uranium, we can use something much more abundant, much more easy to use. He thought, what if we can use thorium? So what is thorium? Thorium is an element that you find virtually everywhere. In every cubic meter of soil, you have one gram of thorium. Of course, there are, many, there are places that are much richer in thorium, but virtually you find it everywhere. In your kitchen, your, your, your granite slabs contain thorium. The energy of the Earth, the, the, the molten core of the Earth, is, is essentially due to the decay of thorium inside the Earth. So thorium has already given us some energy here. Uh, moreover, thorium is a very concentrated kind of energy. So if you want to light up the planet with thorium, we need just like 6,000 tons of thorium per year. This is amazing. Not only that, if you want to compare it to the uranium cycle in waste management, 
and the uranium cycle to produce one gigawatt a year, we need like 250 tons of uranium that will produce 250 tons of waste, which will stay radioactive for 10,000 years. Watch it. In thorium, we only need one ton. And not just that, that one ton will produce one ton of waste. And that one ton of waste, 83% of which will become stable only in 10 years. Amazing. That's not all about thorium. Thorium is also beautiful because it's very cheap. It's so cheap, let me give you just an idea, that if in Lebanon we want to produce one gigawatt of electricity per year out of fuel oil, which is petrol, we need something like $1.5 billion a year. You know how much we need from thorium? $50,000. So here we go, and thorium is very abundant. We find it everywhere. The estimated reserves worldwide are for 1,000 years. So here we are, the molten salt thorium reactor is an available technology. It is cheap, it is uh, uh, safe, it's abundant, and especially it's clean. So here's the big question now. Okay, why don't we find molten salt thorium reactor everywhere on the planet, right? Okay, the reason is when Alvin Weinberg presented his final, final version of the, uh, the uh, reactor, his funding stopped for no scientific reason whatsoever. The reasons were the US Army at that time was not interested in funding a reactor that does not produce nuclear weapons. On the other hand, the nuclear industry in the United States was locked down in the old technology. So shifting to a new one would cost them a lot. And finally, politicians. Well, you know politicians, okay? They are mostly interested in votes. So the program died. But that not, that's not the end of the story. Because right now, all over the world, there are people, physicists, and grassroots mo movements, mostly, uh, namely, Kirk Sorensen, who redis rediscovered the, the idea back in 2008, and John Kutch in his Thorium Alliance, they are pushing forward all over the world to build that reactor. Because they believe, as I do believe, that this reactor can save the world. So next time you have a discussion with your family, your friends, and especially with your policymakers, don't forget that we have a fourth option that can save the world. Thank you.